One show that I always used to watch on Cartoon Network was Codename Kids Next Door. The premise revolved around five kids that used gadgets and silly cartoon logic to battle adults who usually made the world harder for children. It was funny, the stories were amusing, it had creative details such as the acronyms used for every episode title, and it had a memorable main cast of characters who many of us used to love seeing on our TV screens. It ran for six seasons, starting in December of 2002 and ending in 2008. Even after it ended, the show kept a massive fan base and remains one of the most beloved shows to ever air on Cartoon Network. And that isn't surprising. I've always loved the show, but I feel like I appreciate it a lot more as an adult, which is kind of ironic given its whole premise. Maybe I can just see both sides of the equation now. But no matter how old I get, I think it's safe to say this will always be one of my favorite cartoons. So with a show this popular, there was bound to be a ton of marketing. It had two big video games, one that literally has that as its title, but I'd like to look at some of the online games that many of us might remember playing. Many were released for Cartoon Network's website, but with the fall of Flash and Shockwave, a lot of them are harder to come by these days. One that's especially popular is Operation Startup. The startup acronym doesn't actually stand for anything, so let's just say it means Serious Technical Animation Raring to Understand Play Styles. It was divided into different levels that were released online one by one. At the time, it was referred to as Operation Brief, not to be confused with the episode. As we can see, the original release had this cool border around it. You can see all these different options apart from the game itself. We even have an option we can click to open a new tab if a parent is present. Uh... We can also get a briefing of our upcoming mission. First thing it says is, watch the show. Drat, that was their plan all along. They got us with their subtle marketing. It then says, synchronize your watches. Our first rendezvous is Friday, May 2nd on Cartoon Network. Don't let anything stand in your way. If approached by one of them, reveal nothing. Whoa, when did this turn into a spooky ARG? The goal is to free kids everywhere from the tyrannical rule of adults. Either you're in or you're old. Oh no, anything but that. Then we're told what we're supposed to do. We must complete five missions, one for each kid. And for every one we complete, we get a letter to spell a code. These letters would spell Nigel, the real name of number one. This one unlock a secret stage that would serve as the ending. It was later removed for unknown reasons, and it's hard to find a version of the game where it still works. We'll get to it later, because for now, we have the base game to get through. In the original version, you had this hallway where you could select a mission by clicking a door. You could also look at the equipment you'd be using. We also had cool animations thrown in here and there. Unfortunately, all this was removed from the later release. This one was more simplistic with its presentation, though the game itself mostly remained the same. The bad guys have invaded the kids next door treehouse and you have to defend your base. You play as a different kid every level, but if you go in order, you start with number five. The dreaded suburban pirate Sticky Beard is invading. He and his pirate minions have cut the power, so you have to turn it back on. You take control of number five as you move around the base to collect stuff. You take rather big steps there. Whoa, where did these guys come from? They weren't in the room behind me. The pirate minions Chewie and Gooey will occasionally run across the screen, and it's really hard to time a jump so you can make it over them before they hurt you. The button to jump is the same as the one to go up a staircase, so you'll often wind up using the wrong command when trying to escape. You have to collect these candy cane swords to use in the final battle, just like in the episode. Also, watch out for trap doors. You take fall damage from not using the stairs, and you need every ounce of health you can get. On several screens, Sticky Beard will be on the lookout. If he sees you, he'll throw candy at you. You can duck to avoid it, but even better, if you duck behind one of these boxes, he'll lose sight of you, even if he's mid-throw. Eventually, you reach a room with goggles in it. By pressing the spacebar at random points throughout the map, you might be able to find a secret room with a lampshade in it. By collecting three, you can assemble the device that will grant you access to the final room. Unfortunately, all this is easier said than done. Since you have to stop and look for the hidden rooms, you leave yourself an open target for Sticky Beard and his minions. Chewie and Gooey are already tough enough to jump over. But eventually, when you reach the final room, the format changes and you face Sticky Beard in a sword fight. You can swing the sword four different ways, and the way you swing it has to correlate with the direction Sticky Beard swings his. You can press left to defend, but it breaks one of your swords, so you better have collected all of them. If Sticky Beard swings up, you have to hit down, but if he swings down, you have to hit right. 
And if he swings to the middle, you hit up. This is very confusing, and it's hard to remember what to do in the middle of the fight. If he drains your health before you drain his, which is really easy for him to do, you have to start all over from the very beginning of the number 5 stage. Then it's back to jumping over Chewie and Gooey. This is only the first stage, and it's by far the hardest. How's that for your kids next door initiation? So let's move on to number four stage. He was always my favorite, probably because I can also relate to always having my eyes covered by bangs. His stage is a bit more complicated. The villain this time is Night Brace, the evil dentist who only wants you to take care of your teeth. How sinister. You can't jump in this, but you can punch, which is sort of an improvement, I guess. You can move up and down slides to reach different platforms, plugging in outlets and collecting ammo for your boss fight. You activate mechanisms to give yourself slides, and if you see Night Brace, you can punch him until he leaves. But watch out for his boomerang. It comes back. The worst obstacle is this swinging boxing glove that will clobber you at random. You don't have much time to react to it, and sometimes it'll swing more than once. But aside from that, it's fun to slide around and beat the heck out of Night Brace. I'm not a big fan of the boss fight, though. You have to time your shots perfectly so you hit him before he hits you. It's hard to tell when you have an opening. Sometimes when I think I do, I end up getting hit. Wait, we both died? Come on, that should totally count as a win. The painful thing about the boss fights is that all of them are reasonably difficult, but you can't train your skills at them because you get sent back to the beginning of the stage whenever you lose. The bosses also have a lot of health, making the fights with them even more stressful. This whole game can take hours to complete, and without a save system, you have to beat it all in one sitting. This truly represents the cruelty of adulthood. So now let's check out number three. This time, the invader is Grandma Stuffum. You know, the mean old lady who wants us to eat a whole lot. How bad could she be? Well, the answer is... not at all. She's one of the easiest enemies to avoid, and the stage is fairly simple. Her liver and onion henchmen are similar to the pirates, but the overall stage is easy to understand. You move around collecting power cords so you can charge the mosquito's empty battery. That's the kids next door's flying ship. You collect teddy bears to use as ammo, but avoid butterflies and flowers. Not because they hurt you, but because number three gets so distracted by them that she leaves herself open to enemy fire. Seriously, how can you not love number three? She's silly, all things considered. I know I'm the most unsilly creator on the internet who has never made a single joke in his life, but I'll allow it. Number three's boss fight is actually the easiest. Only after a rocky start, though. You aim your thumper device to shoot teddy bears at onions, but it's extremely hard to aim. Thankfully, it only lasts a couple turns. Then Grandma Stuffing comes in and stirs, giving you the prime opportunity to shoot her. You just do this until she goes down. Honestly, the simplicity is a breath of fresh air. Thank you, number three. Now let's see what number two has to offer. He has to build a flying apparatus, and he's facing off against the common cold. Not the illness, mind you, but the villain named common cold. His weakness is orange juice, so you have to stock up on it. Now just look at how number two controls. This is goofy. He can't even jump, even though you have the option to. The instructions refer to the command as try to jump. You have to collect parts for your flying machine, as well as orange juice. You also have to avoid lasers that shoot germs and... Oh my. That is a brutal obstacle to have in a kid's game. Even though I know it's a kid's game and it isn't going to be a big bloody mess if it hits me, I'm still really paranoid whenever I have to cross these things. But the stage is easy. The boss fight, on the other hand, is hard to explain. Tubes are filled with snot and you have to fly to avoid the shots common cold fires at you. You can move pretty much anywhere. Your goal is to smash the tubes once they're empty so they shatter. The challenging part is that it's hard to tell where you're supposed to fire to hit the tubes. Sometimes I think I have a target locked, but I end up missing before it fills itself again. It's also extremely fast and everything is happening at once, so it's a lot to take in. At least there aren't people inside those tubes this time. For some reason, this fight reminds me of something I'd see in an old Bionicle Flash game. Maybe it's because of the mechanical scorpion, or the fact that these both came out around the same time. But once it's defeated, the only stage left is number ones. You're up against the Toilinator and you need your special device, the Splanker, to fight him. This stage is heavily involved with all the different mechanics it has. For one, Lizzie will chase you in a similar fashion to the Liver and Onions or the Pirates. Stay away from me, Vicky. There are also traps where you have to jump to a metal platform in between trap doors. It can be hard to time it correctly. You can also use showers and lamps to teleport. The Toilinator is throwing toilet paper at you the whole time, too. Once you find the Splanker, you can smash protective glass to reveal switches. 
When you flip enough of them, you can enter your final showdown with the Toilinator. He throws toilet paper at you and you have to deflect it with your Splanker. This sends it flying back to him. If it hits you, you take damage. If it hits him, he takes damage. And sometimes Lizzie will run by and you'll have to jump over her. If the Toilinator throws the paper overhead, you have to duck. If he rolls it, you have to jump. If he throws it to the center, you have to hit it with your Splanker. Wow, I can't stop saying Splanker, can I? This goes on for a while, both because he has a ton of health and there's no telling which move he'll make next. This fight can get pretty close by the time you win, but once you do, you've beaten the game. At least the newer version of it. If you're playing the original, you still have one stage left. Entering the code Nigel will unlock the true ending. The kids next door board the Mosquito and take off to battle the delightful children from down the lane, their most fearsome group of rivals, second only to the new kids on the block. You're in a nice-looking overhead view above the city, firing ice cream at the enemy ship while also avoiding their shots and floating mines. You can collect ice cream to refill your ammo and make sure the kids don't get exhausted while flying, because otherwise the ship crashes. But it's really easy and satisfying to win. That brings us to the end of Operation Startup. Now there's a lot to appreciate here, especially if you're a fan of the show. The animation is perfectly in line with it, there are plenty of references, and the characters act like their usual selves. It's cool that they were able to work their personalities into the gameplay mechanics. The way you use different tools is also a nice addition, and the overarching concept is great. The villains have invaded the kids next door treehouse, you gotta protect it. The different stages allow you to explore this iconic location and engage with the surrounding area. As a fan of a franchise, could you ask for anything more? These are all strengths, but I will admit the game could have used a little polishing. I wish you had the option to try a boss battle again after losing. It's tough having to play the whole stage all over again, especially because the stages themselves can get pretty tough. Maybe they would feel more merciful if you had more health or the ability to regenerate it. But I guess the kids next door take this line of work seriously and won't accept any work that falls short of being the absolute best. But this was pretty decent. A good representation for what the show is about. But let's not call it off just yet. While we're here, there are a bunch of other Kids Next Door creations that are worth checking out. I mean, how often do I get to talk about it? So let's move on to a completely different one that has an entirely different feel. This is Operation Save. In this, Captain Stickybeard and his crew have invaded the treehouse and captured the Kids Next Door. Only number four has evaded capture, so now you must play as him and rescue everyone else. The short cutscenes are in 2D, but the gameplay is in 3D. It sort of looks like it was made in the 3D Groove Engine. You collect candy to unlock doors while shooting pirates with your water gun. They have water guns of their own, so you can upgrade your weapon by collecting ones from the bad guys you kill. This also refills your ammo, which you use up in every room. You go from room to room throughout your treehouse and wipe out the bad guys. Then you get a cutscene of you saving one of your captured friends. This is a lot of fun, and I really enjoy blasting people away. The graphics might not be the greatest, but I can excuse it. Sadly, only the first two stages are available, and everything after them is considered lost. It would be nice if we could recover them, because I'm interested in seeing what the future levels look like. Even level 2 had this cool outdoorsy look. So let's move on to another completely different one. KND Slam Dunk is a Kids Next Door version of basketball. We all know how much I love basketball games on this channel. Sadly, number four isn't playable in this. This is clearly devastating to me. But fine, I'll take number three. You have a teammate and you have to run around the court like a basic basketball game. You can snatch the ball from the opponent, block it when they make a shot, or pass it to your teammate and make shots of your own. But your teammate is controlled by the computer. I also keep confusing the keys to grab the ball and block, so I often do this random jump and allow everyone to run ahead of me. Why does this feel so in character for number three? You can also sprint to a certain spot in the court to push the shoot button and perform a special move. But I can hardly ever get it to work. Even in the tutorial. Maybe I'm just bad at basketball. Maybe I should try swimming instead. No pee in the ool, not entirely related to the episode with the same name, is a fun little challenge where you have to keep the kids next door from being captured by adults who want to ruin your fun in the pool. You switch between each of them and move them away as these two dudes pursue them. It gets easier with every character you lose. The less you have to focus on, the better. It's great. I also really like the digital style of this. So now let's check out a few other small ones. This is Beat Your Vegetables. First off, listen to this music. It's surprisingly awesome.
So number two has accidentally eaten some healthy Brussels sprouts, so he shrinks himself down to destroy them. I mean, that's one way to cut calories. You fly around the screen at mass acceleration, shooting a trillion Brussels sprouts that come flying at you. They surround you and you have to move out of the way, destroying as many as you can before they take you down. Defeat is imminent, so take as many of them down with you as you can. It's a rush, I can say that much. Another simple one is Code Breaker. I like the blueprint style of instructions. You're chasing Sticky Beard down a seemingly endless hallway, so you have to open every door he shuts on you. You do this by watching these lights go up in an order, then repeating the combination. You mostly just go until you lose. The animation is nice and the concept is fine, but they do send you back a level if you mess up. I guess they had to keep you playing somehow. This one is Rainbow Monkey Rundown. You control number three and navigate a boat through a stream while using a yo-yo to fight evil knights that are trying to capture you. Oh no. Do you know what this reminds me of? No. No. I can't. No. No. Not again. No. But this one's actually really easy. You can swing your yo-yo anywhere and hit anything that comes your way. The upgrades are really cool too. I especially like this one that explodes whenever you hit someone, but for some reason I don't get as many enemies whenever I collect it. This is a no fun zone I see, but I like this one a lot. It's something good and mindless to keep yourself occupied. So now let's do the complete opposite of that. This is Operation Rail. This is something you can play if you feel like raging at an old computer game. The kids next door have been kidnapped by the delightful children and now they're tied to the tracks of a roller coaster. You control number two and you have to save them all by playing one stage at a time. Whenever you rest rescue one, they join you in the cart for the next stage. But this is unforgivingly difficult. You want to move fast, but you actually have to go slow because countless enemies will come on screen and shoot you at the same time. Their bullets are really small and hard to see, and because you're constantly moving, it's hard to avoid them. Ice cream regenerates your health, but it's extremely rare and doesn't compensate for how much you'll probably lose. The delightful children will sometimes roll in with a car of their own, and they're basically a mini boss fight. You can jump and hover for a bit, but this is only to avoid obstacles on the rails, such as these annoying walls that almost always hit you. The real kicker is that your health doesn't regenerate whenever you finish a stage, and when you die, no matter how far along you are, you go back to the very beginning of the very first stage. You have to delicately ease into every new screen, backing up regularly, then button mash to shoot whatever enemies come your way. But here's the catch. You're being timed. You have to go slow to avoid being bombarded, but if you don't keep up the pace, you lose anyway. To be honest, I can't even get past the third level. I do like how the game over screen takes out whichever characters you save, though. Forget about the other ones. If you want a real challenge, give this one a go. It's definitely a ride you won't soon forget. The concept is similar to Ice Creamed, which is similar to the episode Ice Cream. <coughs> hey, was that a fart sound? You control number two and fly around with some wild controlling. He flies in every direction and you have to steer him past obstacles to save the other kids next door. It's goofy and pretty alright, not nearly as hard as Operation Rail. Now here's Protect and Swerve. Ah, that title. For this, you're chasing the usual suspects as the kids next door in different vehicles. You switch between them as they're needed and try to shoot the enemy down before they reach the goal. Number one is fast, two can fly over obstacles but is really slow, three can go over water, four can go over hedges, and five is a tank that can take a lot of hits. Your enemy can also take a lot of hits, so you have to be constantly shooting at them and you can't let them get too far ahead. Everyone has their own individual health and ammo, so if one runs out, you can't use them anymore. It's fine, and I appreciate the amount of detail that went into it. It's an okay way to spend your time. I really just can't get over the title. But now let's get on to some more amusing ones. One of the biggest flash game companies that many corporations frequently hire to make games for them is called This Is Pop. We're no stranger to them on this YouTube channel, but it's always surprising to see which companies they've made stuff for. These next four were made by them for Cartoon Network, far more wholesome than those disgusting games they made for PETA. Seriously, why did they do that? This is Downhill Derby. It's a cute little downhill race where you choose one of the kids to face off against the others. Number one is easily the best with great control response and acceleration. Four isn't great with either of those, but he makes up for it with his max speed. Uh-oh, looks like we've got a lover's quarrel here. Two has max response and acceleration, but the lowest speed. Three has the opposite issue. Five is the most well-rounded. She also has the coolest car. I mean, don't get me wrong, Four's bathtub is great too. You collect candy to speed up while avoiding obstacles. 
You can also ram into others, but you usually end up pushing them forward and helping them. It's best to just avoid everything and stay in your lane as best as you can. You can either do a race or a Sunday drive mode, which gives you access to every map for a simple run down the course. The maps don't look too different, but the obstacles you face can get more intrusive with some of them. I like the dashboards that tell you the details at the bottom of the screen. Each of them look different depending on who you play as. This is cool. It has nice music, too. This next one is called Operation Graduates, similar to the episode. It's an overhead shooter with a really interesting element. You choose one of the kids to pilot a ship, then you fly over a field shooting at enemies while collecting bubbles with your friends in them. Your friend's ship is then attached to yours, giving you twice the firepower and making a big conglomeration of your vehicles. These can get really messy, but I really like this mechanic. It makes it just a bit more engaging than your average space shooter. This is Pop also made a Halloween game called Operation Trick or Treat. It doesn't have too much in common with Kids Next Door apart from the occasional character you meet to get collectibles from. You play as some kid who can change costumes and get superpowers and you have to collect all the candy in every stage by using your different abilities to get past obstacles. The witch can turn these enemy ghosts into frogs. The skeleton can use his skeleton key to open doors. Okay, that's clever. The vampire can turn into a bat and fly over stuff. Well, some stuff. And the Frankenstein monster can smash some stuff to clear a path. You're being timed, so you have to be quick about it, but it's really forgiving. You can unlock new stages just by getting close to your candy goal. It's a clever enough concept. Good for a basic Halloween game. The last one by This Is Pop is Operation Tommy. It's just a Lunar Lander with Tommy in it. It isn't too similar to the episode with the same name either. You just land Tommy on a platform and there you go. I think we can all agree this is the best one so far. Though I do want to mention something about this episode in particular. Does anyone else ever feel really sick watching it? Something about the characters talking with stuffy noses and making all these references to sickness kind of makes me feel unwell myself. Kind of like when your throat starts to hurt as soon as someone mentions a sore throat. This episode is dangerous, man. Operation Grounded is actually a bit more similar to the episode it's based on, but not by much. Turnips have invaded the Kids Next Door headquarters, so that means you have to stop them by tunneling into the ground and blowing them up. You control the pipe pod and drill downwards, clicking to hold an explosion that'll encapsulate any attacking turnips nearby. Some are stationary and others move in for an attack, but you need to destroy as many as you can. It's really satisfying. You can keep yourself occupied with this. I think it would have been better with a giant rabbit though, but if you're looking for one that's more complex, this is Intruders in the Park. Like with Operation Startup, this is five stages long with each character having their own. For the plot, there are intruders. And they're in the park. The kids next door need to stop them. When we begin, we start with number three's stage. She's up against Grandma Stuffum, who has an ice cream truck. As soon as you press play, you barely have enough time to figure out what's going on before you're bombarded with ice cream and met with the game over. And yeah, that energy will keep up for the entirety of this. You're supposed to shoot Grandma, but your weapon doesn't seem to work. And my initial assumption was that I could use the bushes for cover when she shoots at me, but you can't. They're just a decoration. Now that's deceitful. She rapidly shoots ice cream at you, and you can only take three hits. If you can avoid the ice cream and reach the truck, then you can use your weapon. You can still miss, but if you hit Grandma enough times, you move on to number five stage. In this, you're trying to shoot a basketball into a hoop, but the Toilinator is blocking you. You have to aim perfectly and land three shots to win, but it's hard enough to land one. Nothing really tells you what angles qualify to make good shots at, so you just have to make one and replicate it two more times. If you lose, you go back to the very beginning with number three. But unlike in some other games, you get a code at the end of every stage. You can enter it to continue where you left off. It's a good idea for an online game that kids might not be able to beat in one sitting, but when I am playing it in one sitting, I kind of wish I could just continue without having to go through the whole process of entering a code. It's not too bad right now, but it does get more annoying in the stages when it becomes constant. The next stage is number twos. You're spying on gardeners and you have to shoot them with tennis balls. You can only see them through binoculars and for some reason you're rocking up and down. Maybe you're on a seesaw, but wouldn't you have a better shot if you just stood still? Even so, it's the easiest one. You just line up the launcher with every gardener, then shoot them. Next is number four. This one is actually the most fun. The delightful children are walking down the lane, and you have to kick trash cans into them. They keep coming, and they're eliminated one by one as you hit them. The trash cans roll to the other side of the street, so if you run out, you have to cross to the other side without being hit by the children. 
Easier said than done, but once you beat it, you reach number one stage, and as can be expected, it's the hardest of them all. Faucets are spinning and shooting water rapidly. You have to reach switches to turn them off without being hit. They cover most of the field, so you barely have any walking space. I had to replay this one an absurd amount of times because it was almost impossible for me to step anywhere without being hit. It didn't matter which switch I went for first. Every single time, I had to put in the code again. In all honesty, it got really tedious. But then I discovered something. This stage is kind of bugged. I was able to walk out of the screen and move past the faucets to reach the switches. From there, I was able to win. Ultimately, while I think this has a good style with visuals that are true to the show, a little more time and work on the details could have made the individual stages better. I think if they were to flesh it out more, it could be pretty good. It's just rough around the edges. So now here's one called Operation Robbers, based on the episode. You play as number four and the Six Gum Gang has stolen all your homework. You're on a moving train slash school bus and shooting at them in a western-styled match. It's mostly just a series of non-stop shots until you run out of ammo. Then you take a bunch of hits until you finally reload. Then you move on to the next wagon and repeat the process. Some obstacles can come up here and there, but it's very repetitive. Fine if you like shooting things. I like the feel of it all. It has that nice western feel, blended with a bit of modernity. It's also probably the truest episode adaptation we've played so far. Now here's a bigger one. Operation Zero Outnumbered is based on the movie. You control number one and battle an army of senior Sita zombies. You also have to defend your teammates who turn into zombies if they get bitten. You can shoot zombies to stun them and throw a grenade to change them back to normal. Once you do, you wait through a cooldown before you can throw the next. If a zombie reaches you, it strangles you and you have to repeatedly hit the arrow keys to mash away from it. The strategy is to lure them all into one place before throwing a grenade at them. Or just hit everyone you see, that worked for me. But things get weird when the format switches up after a few stages. This army of zombie hamsters comes marching toward you in a straight line that stretches across the floor. You have to shoot at them or throw a grenade to knock them out of line so they don't hit you. These segments can feel like they go on forever. The first time I played, I wondered if this was the end. But then you return to the regular format. Later, you reach the first boss, Toilinator. He's actually a real pain to fight against because he shoots his attack across the screen, but the direction he chooses to attack in each round is unpredictable, so you might not be prepared for it. But once you beat him, you go through the usual process all over again. Fun as the game can be, it is a bit long for how often you do the same thing. The final boss is number 362, and just look at her go. She's so fast, it seems almost impossible to dodge her a lot of the time. You can't attack until she does this tornado move where she spins at you. You have to wear her out, then you attack while she's in a daze. If she hits you though, she doesn't get worn out. Thankfully, even if you run out of lives, this game has a very forgiving system. You keep your progress, but you lose your score. Honestly, that's a fair trade-off. More games should implement things like this. But surprisingly, this was popular enough to receive an official parody. In light of the crossover special, The Grim Adventures of the Kids Next Door, Operation Zero Out Mandied was released. It replaced number one with Mandy from The Grim Adventures of Billy and Mandy, but other than that, it's the same. Let's take a look at one more, then we'll check out some especially big ones. This is Tummy Trouble, where we're facing off against Grandma Stuffum once again. You control number one and move through her kitchen facility to battle all the sentient evil foods. You have to find pass cards in every room by shooting the food and destroying objects. The enemies attack and try to make you eat them, which gives you gas. You need to find gas lacks to de-gas yourself. Why not take some Pepto-Bismol? I gotta admit, playing this after eating made my stomach hurt a little. It's almost as if I could feel the food being forced into me. Though it's kind of funny that Grandma is trying to make you eat ice cubes. Maybe it's her way of hydrating you. Speaking of Grandma, she appears at the end of every level in a really easy boss fight. The whole thing is entertaining enough, but be prepared for a lot of wandering. You have to check every room for the pass card, so there's a lot of going back and forth. The enemies also respawn, so fighting them isn't really necessary. The pass cards are always hidden in objects anyway. But now let's move on to something much bigger. These next four games come with a story. A legend, if you will. About a little thing known as Sky GameStar. Sky GameStar, later known as Sky Games, was a television service that you could use to play different games on TV. Now that's a real blast to the past. You would have to pay for sessions, but they had a remarkable amount of content based on cartoons made by different developers. Because you played using a TV remote, their games were notorious for using a ton of controls. Unfortunately, over time, these games were lost to history and the service is no longer available. But thanks to the work of a dedicated community, along with developers who willingly gave the public access to their work, many of these have been recovered and are playable online. The developers in question were part of Denki, who made the games we'll be checking out. 
The first is called Operation Teenager. This was the last one they released, but we'll look at it first because it's significantly different from the others. At the start, we see a teacher dragging the tied-up number three into a school. Numbers two, four, and five show up with one talking to them over radio. Then they break into three separate rooms and the gameplay commences. The controls have been adjusted to fit a keyboard, so some of them can be confusing to get a grasp on. Number one gives you instructions as you switch between two, four, and five to rescue three. The teachers are using a machine to turn kids into teenagers, which is downright despicable. So now you have to save three from becoming one. You move through the school, checking different rooms and using the strengths of each character to progress. Two is strong, so he can push barrels and activate switches. Four is the only one who can attack, so he can punch bad guys, buttons, and obstacles to destroy them. Five has a grappling hook that she can use to cross over chemical spills or grab books from afar. She can either throw these at switches or bad guys. You can also find upgrades for each character as you go, allowing them to push or break heavier obstacles, or giving five a longer grab. Apple. The first enemies you encounter are football players. If they see you, they charge. But once they're set in their way, you can step out of their path and watch them run into a wall. This stuns them, giving four a chance to kill them, or five if you have a book. Later on, you meet teachers who are almost as unforgiving as my elementary school teachers. They will see you enter a room almost instantly and go into a mode where they rapidly charge and swing their pointer stick. It's very hard to hit or avoid them. You either have to have remarkable timing or just endure them chasing you the entire time you explore the room. There'll always be one or two spaces behind you, so don't even remotely slip up. Heh, <laughs> get it? Remotely? Because you use a TV remote? You can also collect candy for bonus points, as well as rainbow monkey toys that three left as a trail. As long as you save her in the end, that's all that really matters. One thing I really like about this is that the background changes depending on which part of the school you're in, so you aren't playing through the same scenery the entire time. Toward the end, you go in the basement, so everything changes considerably. The backgrounds have some nice details, and I like the general atmosphere. It has a pleasant, nostalgic look to it. The gameplay is also really fun. It's a sort of strategy game where you use each character to solve a series of puzzles and reach the next room. Some of them are more challenging to figure out, but they never feel impossible. Some are hard, sure, but never excessive. If you make a mistake, such as pushing the barrels in the wrong order, you can simply leave the room and come back to find everything reset. Anti-frustration details like this that keep you from having to do the whole thing all over again are really appreciated. My only real criticism is maybe the teachers should have been nerfed a little. Maybe they could stop and catch their breath or something. Other than that, this is really good. The best one we've played so far. It ends when you save number three and destroy the teenager machine. Then number four goes back in at the last second to punch it. How in character. But aside from this, Denki created four other Kids Next Door games that mostly followed the same style as each other. We'll start with Operation Bittersweet, which is the first and the most unique of the four. These all followed the same ongoing story with the kids next door facing off against Sticky Beard. In this, they've all been captured and have to escape his ship. You control number four, who instantly breaks out of his prison cell. Free. But here, the controls take a bit more getting used to. I actually went most of the game without fully understanding them. To jump to a platform, you have to press the up arrow while underneath it. It's confusing at first, but you get used to it. In the rooms next to you, you can speak to number one and number two. One says he can easily escape, but he refuses to because the ship is infested with insects. Two also offers to build you a gadget if you bring him sticky gum for it. So now you have to collect gum and insects to appease your teammates. Three and five are trapped on the other side of the ship, so we'll get to them later. You go around collecting candy for points as well as whatever items you're assigned to find. You also have to find keys that can open different doors. If you pause, you can see a rundown of your stats and progress. It will tell you which rooms of the ship you've explored and which ones you still have to clear. You can kick or throw boxes, barrels, and chests to find whatever's hidden inside, and you can also kick pirate enemies that are walking around. The regular pirates are easy, but the ones that throw candy canes or cannonballs at you are the absolute worst. You can kick the projectiles away if you're fast enough, but these pirates don't go down with simple kicks. You can stun them, but to permanently defeat them, you need to throw candy canes of your own, which you can collect. I should also mention the candy rooms, which you can use to collect candy for bonus points. You can also sometimes find extra lives in there, which will be useful when dealing with pesky candy cane throwing pirates. You can also collect hamsters, but not for any particular reason. You can travel to different parts of the ship, including above deck, and it's nice to see all the work that went into designing it. It seems like they actually made a legitimate map of the ship for you to travel through. Though sometimes it does feel like you're running back and forth without much of an idea for where to go. I wish the in-game map indicated which rooms had unopened doors in them. I think that would help tone down the aimless wandering. But anyway, once you collect the bugs and the gum, you save number one and two. 
Two gives you a bubblegum shield you can deflect projectiles with. It's useful, but it takes a moment to use, and the pirates can walk right past if they get too close. It's better to just use the candy canes. Now you can also proceed to the other side of the ship, but watch out. Sometimes Sticky Beard will come by to attack you himself. He's really easy to fight, though. He just takes a few hits and controls the same as the usual projectile pirates. On the other side of the ship, you can find number three and five. Five refuses to leave because Sticky Beard stole her secret stash of candy, so you have to find every last bit of it. If you were like me and collecting every piece of candy you saw, this shouldn't be too hard. Number three lost all her rainbow monkeys and refuses to escape until you find them. Once you find everything, you get a new weapon from 3, but you also get the ability to leave the ship and win the game at any time. You can stick around if you want to try and get a good score by collecting candy and killing pirates. This is where the game crashed for me, but it's okay because you can use 3's weapon in the other games too, so we'll still get a look at it. I really enjoyed this one. There's a ton of detail and it's fairly long, so you'll get a good deal of gameplay out of it. I do think it could have been improved by having the map tell you where the doors are, though. Also, it's fun to throw objects at pirates, but because the keys to pick up and attack are the same, I often end up performing the wrong action. That can be dangerous in the middle of combat. Other than that, it's really good. But unfortunately, nowadays, you do have to beat it in one sitting, which can be troubling with how long it is. But at least this piece of history has been preserved. The sequel to this is Operation Shipwrecked. This time, you're shipwrecked on an island and collecting fruits instead of candy, though you do use gumballs instead of candy canes. You still do fetch quests for each of your teammates, but they aren't locked in prison cells this time. You have to find hamsters for number one and junk for number two to build your shield with. This time, it's metallic. Once again, three and five have lost their rainbow monkeys and candy stash. Seriously, you'd think they'd hold on to them better if they cared about them so much. So now let's try out number three's thumper weapon. It fires teddy bears and gobstoppers. If they're like the ones from Ed, Ed and Eddie, I'm sure they're highly lethal. But this is the worst weapon in the entire series. You have to aim it, and it takes too long to do, so it gives the enemies more than enough time to hit you first. Basically, everything from Bittersweet has been kept in, just with a new environment. I like it, though especially the shipwreck you can travel to. Though I felt this was even more confusing to navigate than the first, especially with the amount of platforms you can only reach by entering through different parts of a screen. It's still good, but I think I prefer Bittersweet. The sequel to this is Operation Revenge, and it has a few changes to the formula. This time, you need to activate your clam cannon to blast Sticky Beard and his crew into oblivion. As we all know, the clam cannon was by far the most genius invention of the kids next door. But you need to find clams to use as ammo. This time, you're in the treehouse, but it isn't too stylistically different from the ship in the previous games. But you can also board the ship in this. The menu also looks a lot cooler with a more digital layout. You also have some new gadgets such as a cheese wheel that can obliterate any pirate when thrown, as well as the ability to disguise yourself as Sticky Beard. Enemies won't attack you and you can get past sentries by fooling them. It's great. You have to find clams for number one and metal scraps for number two, but take a completely random guess for what you need to find for three and five. That's right, it's the candy stash for five and hamsters for three. What, what did you expect? The hamsters the kids next door used to power their electricity have been scared off and you need to find them. What's great is that number five gives you a really useful upgrade for finding her stash. Your kicks are now more lethal and you can use two of them to take out candy-throwing pirates rather than just stunning them. What's also unique about this one is that once you find everything for everyone, it still isn't over. You have to reach Sticky Beard's quarters and battle him yourself. He's really easy as long as you spam the cheese wheel. You also get some funny dialogue if you go in wearing his disguise. Once you beat him, you fire the clam cannon and destroy his ship once and for all. Like with the others, I enjoyed this. I like the new features that set it apart from the other two, but unfortunately, I did a lot more mindless wandering around in this than the other ones. The setting is more complicated and it's easy to find yourself going back and forth. It can make the game seem a lot longer than it was probably meant to be. I still have to say Bittersweet is the best of the three with this format, but Teenager is the best overall. Still, all of these are worth playing for yourself. Sadly, there is a fifth one called Operation Gumdrop, but it's completely lost and probably beyond recovery. There aren't many salvageable details, but I assume it followed a similar formula to these. This is an unfortunate curse of the passage of time. But no matter how long it's been, it's always exciting to go back and revisit these relics. Shows like Kids Next Door and the games that came from it will always be cherished by those who gladly remember them. Time may go by and some of these may be lost to the ages, but the memories will always remain. Thank you for joining me. I will see you in the next memory.